Well, hi everyone, this is Dr. Bob from Northern Michigan again, and we're going to continue our series on medical marijuana, specifically related to the Michigan program, but many of these features go on to other areas as well. Now, yesterday we started off with how to fill out the forms, and on that auspicious start, uh, we're going to push the envelope even further, and we're going to spend about 15 minutes watching the paint dry in my hallway at my house. Now seriously, today our subject is going to be, who is a medical marijuana patient in Michigan? At least in my practice. So I thought I'd probably dispel some of the myths and maybe address some of the comments in my community section. So let's take a moment and sneak on over to my YouTube channel page and we'll go up to the community tab, as you can see up here, and go down and have a look at the very first entry. And that is where I announce that I'm going to take on this medical marijuana series. Now, as we go down, we see a couple of people that post um, that they're glad to see me address it. And then uh, talking about alcohol versus marijuana. Somebody wants a cookie recipe. Here's somebody that says it's the right now it's the only thing controlling her husband's multiple sclerosis pain, but it's rather expensive to buy. Here's somebody with glaucoma. Here's a question about the best way to use it is as far as smoking or using metables. I actually prefer metables because of the lack of uh, carbon monoxide from the burning plant material. Here I'm talking about another one of my um, videos on chronic pain. Somebody wants to go into the science of medical marijuana and we will be addressing uh, the effects of marijuana on each of the approved conditions. And I have a link to the Granny Storm Crow list which is more than a thousand pages of links to medical studies on over 400 different conditions. I suggest you maybe pop in and have a look at that. Now if you go over to this you can actually read all of these comments, but there's one right here that I want to particularly emphasize, and that's from Miss K. Okay, let me tell you what this series is about. It's different from what I've done before on YouTube. I'm out of the studio, I'm into my physician office um, at various locations throughout the state of Michigan. You're also going to follow me on my travels as I travel all over the state. I'll be going to Phoenix later on this month, and I'll be making some videos from there as well. It's designed to be a conversation between professionals that really want to talk about medical marijuana and bring it to a more professional level. Now, I have tens of thousands of patients that have written me and talked to me about how cannabis has changed their lives. Uh, they're off of narcotic pain medicines, their seizures are under control, their glaucoma is under control. Uh, I've even had people claim that their cancer went into remission over it, although that's not something that I promote. But every now and then you're going to run into an individual that feels the need to control the behavior of others. And Miss Kay is one such person. So I'd like to go over her comments and then address each of her points. And then we're going to go into a discussion of who is a typical medical marijuana patient. All right, so let's go ahead and have a look at this comment she put on my community page. If you are going to start promoting marijuana, then I am out. I suffer from chronic pain and know that marijuana is a crock. It doesn't do anything for pain, neither does CBD oil. Even if it did work, I couldn't function and do my job stoned all the time. I don't know who could. Okay, so let's go ahead and have a look at this real quick. First of all, nobody has ever made a claim that cannabis is the cure-all for pain and a variety of other conditions. It's very helpful. A lot of people have had very good results, but nobody's ever claiming that it works 100% of the time for 100% of the people. So that's basically kind of a straw man type argument. And it's not the argument that I'm putting forward. Getting stoned all the time and going to work. Nobody is suggesting that people use cannabis and then immediately go to work or go out and fly an airliner. You know, I mean, seriously. Use a little bit of common sense. Alcohol is also legal. You're still not allowed to work or drive with it. People that use cannabis medically tend to use very small amounts of it. They use just enough to coat the receptors and get the relief of their pain, but they don't want to be impaired themselves, and many times they are not impaired. They just have a puff or two, and then that's good for the next few hours. Well, this next paragraph is kind of interesting. Let's not forget all the car accidents caused by marijuana. Have you ever seen one? Can you show me a single car accident that was directly related to somebody having active THC in their system? And she goes on to say that I see it all the time in my own ER. 
every major accident, especially single car, will show either alcohol or marijuana in the system, and I'll certainly agree with the alcohol. Good job, dope. You just rolled your car down an embankment and now are unconscious with a head injury and multiple broken bones. I bet it was totally worth it. Okay, now this paragraph kind of disturbs me a little bit. Uh, first of all, she's claiming automobile accidents due to marijuana. Okay, let me explain something on that. Marijuana, like alcohol, stays in your system for a finite period of time. In the case of active THC, which is the stuff that actually impairs you, it's about 10 to 12 hours. Now, the problem that you run into with cannabis is that it is then metabolized to something called carboxy-THC. Carboxy-THC goes into the fat of your body and stays there and leaks out over the next 30 to 45 days or so. In other words, carboxy-THC is present in your urine for up to a month after your last use. It's present in your hair even longer than that. Now, what happens lots of times with these statistics that you see about marijuana and automobile accidents is they test the patient for carboxy-THC. And if it's present, what they like to do is they like to try and shoehorn cannabis use into the position of being a contributory factor because they found the metabolites of cannabis in the, in the victim. That's not a true reflection of a correlation between cannabis use and an automobile accident. When I was a resident, there was a study done that correlated serum cholesterol levels to death by automobile accident. You know, you can find correlations if you look hard enough. I had another one where we uh, did the blood pressure of a patient compared to their zodiac sign. Now, that's just disingenuous. Her second part of this paragraph kind of disturbs me a little bit. She implies that she somehow works in an emergency room. I was a paramedic before I was a doctor for 10 years in Lansing, and then I became a physician. I've been doing this since I was 19 years old. I have seen oodles of automobile accidents, and I would tend to agree with her if you haven't found somebody that's been drinking at the scene of an automobile accident, you need to keep looking because they're out in a cornfield somewhere. To mock somebody for making bad decisions and ending up with head injuries and broken bones and being unconscious, I don't think that I've ever done that in my life. They've had a tragedy due to a bad decision. They don't need to be mocked about it. And it disturbs me uh, for her humanity that she would do something like that. And that leads me to believe that she is not a healthcare professional. Then she goes on to say that people just want to get high, so they claim it fixes everything. If you were a doctor, then you would know that the more things people claim something fixes, the less it actually does. It's snake oil in the worst form. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. And even worse, I'm stuck having the air around my home constantly polluted with the stench of skunk-ass pot smell from people growing and smoking it. It's disgusting and makes it so I can't go outside my own home that I'm paying dearly for. Well, shoot, you're not at all bitter there, are you? You know, it seems to me that you're more upset with the people that use marijuana than you are with the marijuana itself. Um, and then you go on to say that you're going to unsubscribe, and my attitude is, fare thee well and happy journey to you. Now, let's go ahead and have a look at a real medical marijuana patient, and then some statistics from my practice. Well, folks, I'd like to introduce you to Gary. Gary came into my office a few years ago and didn't have three shiny nickels to rub together in his pocket. We ended up certifying him free of charge and I actually paid his certification fee to the state. About a month later, he came back with a little chocolate pit bull puppy uh, who is our dog, Gracie. And that was for my daughter's birthday. He's just a very kind-hearted man who was confined to a powered wheelchair and suffering quite a bit. Cannabis made his last few years on this earth a little bit more bearable. Now, Gary's subsequently passed away, and he had given me permission to use his photo and his story, but I wanted to introduce you to a real cannabis patient. Well, a few years ago, our illustrious Attorney General here in Michigan, Mr. Bill Schutte, came out with a proclamation that the average medical marijuana patient was an 18-year-old with a hangnail. Now, as a major medical marijuana certification doc here in Michigan, I knew that wasn't true. Most of my patients were like Gary. But how could I prove it? Well, as it turns out, I was developing software at that time to help me with the forms to make sure that they were always filled out correctly. I'm putting the stuff down anyhow, why not get some data from it? So I got things like conditions and ages. So what you do is you just go over to Michigan Marijuana Forms, marijuana with a J, forms with an S, dot com, and I'll put a link to that in there. And then what you do is you just go right up here to where it says About Us, 
down to Michigan Marijuana Statistics. And here it is. Here's our average patient age. Now if you look right over here at the 3 o'clock position, that's the zero. And then each of these pies correspond to an age range. If you go straight across, you'll see the average age range for my patients is 45 to 54. It's actually about 51 years old. Here are the conditions that we treat. And here are our conditions versus the state's data. As you see, we've got an awful lot more cancer patients and fewer HIV, for example. I was part of the people that got PTSD approved, and as you see, we see an awful lot of PTSD in the practice because I work with a lot of veterans. Now, if you go down here, you can actually click on conditions, and you can get an age range for that condition. So there's hepatitis C, and there's PTSD. So feel free to stop by and explore some of this stuff, and it'll tell you a little bit more about the average patients that we see. The bottom line is that medical cannabis patients are the people standing next to you in the grocery store, the sitting next to you in your doctor's office, going to your clinics, at your place of work. So part of the purpose of this series is to try and de-demonize cannabis as a legitimate medical treatment, something that regular traditional physicians should incorporate in their practice, as an alternative to narcotic pain medicines. They're also very good for things like migraines and irritable bowel and fibromyalgia, things that we don't have really good treatments for now. So I hope that through this series, we'll gain some good information and have a little bit of a journey of progress together. This is Dr. Bob. Thank you for stopping by. Make sure you hit that little like and subscribe button down there and hit the bell notification so that you can hear when these new episodes come out. Take care, guys.